So, good morning. Hope everybody of you has coffee and is ready for the second day. Um, welcome to my presentation. Um, it's about a case study or a showcase that I would like to show you what we've done for um, a national TV station. Um, I could directly talk about like four to 10 hours about that and I don't know like what you're really interested in. So it could be more tech, it could be more business, it could be more front end, it could be more hardware, whatever. So I'm gonna go through it, it probably will take half an hour and then we can do it maybe a bit in extended QA because I really wanna answer your questions that you have because it's, yeah, it's a whole project and I said I could talk a lot about it. So um, maybe first about me, I'm Michael or people call me Schnitzel. Um, I'm the guy that yelled at you at yesterday morning to wave at me because I did the group picture. Um, yes, I'm head technology at Amazing Labs. We are a company in Zurich and Austin, Texas. Um, we are 20 people in Zurich and five people in Austin. Um, we are try to be rather smaller, so there are a lot of other big agencies in Switzerland with two to three, 400 people, but we try to keep small to be agile, and that's also one of the reasons why we actually got chosen for that project. So who's the client? Um, the client was Schweizer Radio and Fernsehen. It's the Swiss national television and radio station, um, which the project, which is actually multiple ones, that you probably know. Um, so they do um, white labeling solutions of the voice of Switzerland and Die Größen Schweizer Talente, which is like Switzerland got talent. So it's a talent show. And um, these sites, they have a pretty special requirements. And so basically, it first of all has to be a new site. So they post through the week, before the show happens, they post news, they post updates, what's happening, what's gonna happen, interviews, just stuff beside. Um, but then, during the actual show, um, the second screen gets on. So that's what the site is actually built for. And um, there are roughly around six to 10 shows which are pre-captured. So they are captured in a studio, they are shoot everything. And what basically just kind of happens, somebody presses play while the show is running and we're sitting in the same room and measuring all the, the stuff on the website. But the last three shows, they're actually live. So there are people calling in and saying, okay, I want like, they can vote for people. And the whole live shows are much harder because you cannot really prepare for them. You don't know who is getting to the next round um, and stuff like that. And also, it's, the website is basically built for like 13 times two hours, which is a show. So we build a site that is really actually working only for 26 hours. And, but it has to run during these 26 hours. If, if you lose one show because you deploy something wrong or whatever, yeah, you're basically screwed. So there's no way that you can go back and fix it. Of course, if during the week something happens, yeah, but no, there's no traffic on it. So it's completely different from any website that we have built before because it's so narrow on these time slots and everything just has to work during that time. Um, so what do we mean with second screen? It's basically, it has to be mobile because people are sitting with their iPads, with their mobile phones in front of the TV. So the first screen is the TV and the second screen is the device that you have in your hand. And the idea is basically because people are anyway tweeting, Facebooking and whatever during the show, so why not provide them an experience while the show is running that the TV screen cannot do? So it's about that. Um, it has to be really fast um, because we have a lot of data, a lot of people at the same time that watch the TV show. Um, so it's rather important that the site performs and you have to push. You don't want the people to re like reload all the time. What we basically want is the person goes to the site once, they watch the TV show and their device updates automatically during the show. So there's no need to press any button during the whole show. Um, it's like a second screen of the TV, it automatically updates. And all these things make it a bit, yeah, special or different. So the requirement of mobile is actually pretty easy. I mean, it's Drupal. Um, 
we, we have a Drupal, it's all responsive, no problem. We actually did it in mobile first because seven, during the show we have more mobile traffic than desktop traffic. So 75% of the traffic is mobile. Um, which from a design point of view, why should you design a desktop website when most of the people are actually watching it mobile? So we did a complete only mobile design and we just adapted that through the desktop, um, which actually was the first time that we as an agency were able to do that um, because we could argue that people are looking at it um, on a mobile screen anyway. So that was easy. We do that with Omega 4. We don't use any of the layout systems of Omega 4. We just basically use it as a reset um, to have it HTML5, to have it more clean. Um, we use SAS with Compass and SUSE for grid systems. Nothing special um, here based on um, technologies we use. Um, so the mobile part is actually not something crazy for us. We do a responsive web design all the time. Wasn't anything special um, and such. What is interesting is the live mode. So the live mode is the second screen mode that we enable while the live show is running. And we said we didn't want to go to people to go like, you know, website url.com slash live or something. So we just wanted the people to go back to the homepage. So we had to have a homepage that adapts based on what if the show is currently on or not. And we did that with panels. Um, so you just have a panel with a lot of different panes and some of the panes are either active or not based on a variable. Pretty straightforward and easy, but with that, the people just have to go to the URL they already know and based on if it's a show or not, we show them a bit different content and stuff, um, which worked pretty well in the end. Um, yes, and we have an admin interface um, that is completely stripped down to only what the people need during the show. You can imagine there's a, like, we're updating the site like every 60 seconds. So like the, the homepage changes because the show goes on. So you need an admin interface that is completely stripped down to what the people need at that specific point. So we did a lot of testing with them to before we actually started, we let the people use the site and we saw like how they moved around or what they needed, like what do they need change at the same time. So um, it was really important for us to have an admin interface that is super slick and super easy. We can actually look at it later. No daddy, no daddy, no daddy. Um, so there was a big discussion that we um, had. There's, there are multiple people at the same time working on the site. And there was a lot of, in, in the past, they said like, can you upload the poll, you know, that was about that person and so. So there was a lot of discussion like, how do we talk about Drupal things, like internals? And we realized that the easiest is the node ID. So everywhere where we need to select something or we need to um, delete something or whatever, it's about the node ID. So the editors, they know, can you upload me or can you put um, Node ID 110 to the homepage? Because there's people talking at the same time that, that use the website. And it just was the easiest to use the Node ID. So we adapted like all the views in Drupal. We use admin views um, to have an actually view for the content view and stuff. And we just added the Node ID in there. Um, which is also different. Usually we don't really tell client what a node ID is, but there, if you just need a unique identifier for whatever you have on the site and the node ID was the easiest. To push. Um, so I said, we wanna have the people that go to the website and just visit the page and basically just get a stream of information. We had an initial idea to do, there is an Ajax pane reload, some module on Drupal.org that basically just like from the client side refreshes every 10 seconds or so. And then you just change the content and it will update it. Um, we realized that actually, that actually creates a huge traffic on your side and it's 10 seconds. And in a TV show, 10 seconds can be a long time. So we needed something else. So we found a way that to push, um, so basically whenever the, um, the editors change something on the site and we save it, we push it to all the clients immediately. And it's, it takes like half a second or so. And we use PubNub 
for that. Um, it's a service. It's not cheap, but it works really well. You can build it your own with WebSockets and Socket.io or whatever. But what we really like with PubNub, they handle you almost everything. They have integrations into a lot of different systems. And also they handle your latency and like if you close on your phone, your the browser and you open it again, it will automatically connect again and see what has changed in the past. You have statistics about it. And um, it's from a programmer's point of view, it's super easy. You have like message streams. So on the server side, you just push something at, at, at the message stream. And on the client side, you register to the message streams. And whenever something is pushed on JavaScript, you get, like if you use a JavaScript client, you get basically um, a message and you can handle that. So it's super easy communication. It's fast. You don't need to do anything, um, which we ended up in liking a lot. Um, so yeah, so the browser scripts to the messages, um, and whenever there is a message, um, we have our own JavaScript that then replaces the necessary parts. So um, there it's just custom JavaScript that knows, okay, um, we just updated, I don't know, the top right text, so it goes to edit the top right text. So we replace elements in the DOM of the browser. We talked a lot about using Angular for that because it's basically what it would be really great of. Um, the problem was that the first site we did was three and a half years ago and there was no Angular there yet. Um, so we are still a bit stuck in using custom JavaScript. Um, and we just rebuilt or refactored the site and we didn't unfortunately have the budget to go completely to Angular. Um, so we are talking now with Nathanex shows to actually use an Angular front and for that because it will be much easier to just like replace stuff and update things and such. Then we wanted to have people voting. So that was the main thing. Whenever a talent is on the TV screen, um, you can vote on your phone if you like the performance or not. And it will show you immediately in percentages how much that voting is. Um, so we had to figure out a lot of things um, how we do that. We ended up in using just a core poll module that we never <laughs> used before in any other, uh, on any other project, but it worked. And the problem is that you need um, session cookies for polls. Um, so there is a module called poll anon, which basically um, allows you to vote on um, polls anonymously. And instead of session cookies, it creates a voting cookie. So for every vote you do, it creates a cookie that says you voted for poll ID 77. And then the next time when you refresh, um, instead of the voting form, it will show you the results. So to the browser, you send the voting form and the results, and the browser decides if you already voted or not. The problem is it's that whole thing is hackable. I, it's, it's completely outside of anything, like if you, um, we never had a case that this happened because like we, we measure IP addresses and so, and because the whole site is only on for like two hours, so the people have to be rather fast. Um, but I gave it to people that had, had, that had enough time and they vote in like, it was easy. Like we, and we actually used it for, for load testing. So I have a small script on my, on my PC that, or my Mac that I can run and I do one million votes in 10 minutes. Um, but the client knew that. We talked to the client that this, is that this will happen. The votes itself didn't count. It was more like for the entertainment of the viewers <laughs> um, to sit there and vote. But what we also had is the voting was shown back to the TV screen. So on the first screen, we could actually show the results of the second screen. Um, and what we saw is because during the live shows, there is actually real voting via telephone that you can call in. And we did exactly the same polls as well online that the people can call in. The results were exactly the same. So even though it is hackable, it never happened. And the results could directly be used for like deciding if the person gets the next votes or so. Um, but because it is hackable, um, we said, okay, we have to find something else. What is also important is that every time somebody votes, it pushes the new result to all devices. So, because we'll see later, I have some videos that you see how it works. So, like, we want to have a real-time stats that you can see, like, what is the current results. Um, so every time that somebody 
votes, clicks the vote button to yes or no, or I like that, I don't like that, it pushes again to all the devices the newest results. And with that, you get some really cool like stats, which we'll see later. But I said we have to find another way to vote. We wanted to have a vote that can be used for getting people to the next round. They wanted to have an online voting. So basically during the, um, the live shows and also the shows before, um, the, the, the jury only um, or chose two talents that were like equally good and then they let the online um, the viewers vote who should go into the next round. And we did that with an SMS or text voting and that's unhackable um, because you only have one single device. Um, so we send the people, basically, um, we use a, um, a service called WebSMS, which is like any other SMS. We just really liked the APIs um, from them and it's just like you can send an SMS. So it basically works with that. So the user submits the poll, which one he likes, and then the user receives a text SMS with a code so he enters also his phone number and he, re he receives a code. He, the user enters the code on the website and with that we basically have him, have him validated. Um, if he tries to vote again with the same phone number, we know his phone number, we can basically tell, tell him, sorry, you already voted, you cannot. Of course, if somebody has multiple phone numbers, of course that works, but the amount of phone numbers is not that crazy per person. Um, so maybe people can vote two or three times. And that actually worked really well. We didn't run that during the show because we decided it's too much interaction during the show, like people watching TV. You don't want to overflow them with like, now I have to like get an SMS and enter code and stuff. So we did that after the show. So after the show for the next 48 hours, people can go to the website and vote. Um, and that worked really well. And like we could then announce during the next show, we announced, okay, who won the online voting and they actually then came into the finals of the show. Um, so that was really cool. I talked about FAST. Um, we had in max times 8,000 requests per second. Um, and that's not easy to handle if you don't have the hardware behind to handle such a system. So this is basically what we used. Um, first of all, we use Redis for caching. So all the internal Drupal caches are not in a database. They're completely in Redis. It's um, a memory key value storage, which just allows you to load caches much faster. Then Varnish, um, which is basically the reverse proxy, um, which handles like 99.99% of all traffic only goes into Varnish and it's freaking fast if you configure it correctly. And then there is monitoring and that's basically one of the most important. You can have all servers in front, but you have to look at the stats, what is really happening. So that was the hardware we had. We had two Varnish servers, six web servers, two MySQL servers, two NFS servers, and two Redis servers. And again, you see everything is twice in there. We didn't want to have a single point of failure because if the hardware dies during the show, the show has to continue. And there was no chance that we could um, have any, the only thing that could have happened was that the whole data center blows up. We didn't have a second data center. It was all in the same room. So if you have a fire in the data center, well, we, could, we would have shut down the site. But um, beside of that, we just said, okay, whatever hardware issue, broken power supply, hard drives going crazy, memories exploding, whatever, we want to have the whole thing continuously running. So we had to build a whole cluster that um, supports like auto failovers and stuff. And we Luckily, we never had to use it during the show, um, but it was just good to know like whenever a MySQL dies, there is another one that takes over and does stuff. Um, about Redis, one of our learnings um, that Allaroo, um, which is basically, you can configure Redis to say, okay, you get 10 gigabytes of memory. And whenever I fill more than 10 gigabytes into you, you're gonna automatically delete all the keys. Um, because we have a lot of caches of like old polls, like a poll that the whole HTML is cached. Um, but that's an old one, like it, it was maybe shown to the side, to the user like an hour ago, it's not shown anymore. So we wanna get to remove that. And instead of the Drupal actually going there and removing stuff from the cache that the cache doesn't overfill, you can configure Redis to tell himself like, okay, go and check um, 
which keys are not used in the last time. The problem is what we learned is that it's pretty costly. Um, like during the voting, you have a lot of cash form entries into the cash, and because the if the, uh, if the Redis is already full during that time, it takes Redis a time to first figure out, oh, I have to clear some space before I can get new data. And because that happened at the same time when the show started, that was actually, it took uh, sometimes like two to three seconds to get a new data into, Var into Redis before, because he had to clear first like all its tables and, and empty some things. So we ended up in basically just empty the Redis before, um, which was a pretty easy, because during the whole show, it never filled these 10 gigabytes. But because we had the, sh we had the, uh, the Redis running through the whole week, it like slowly filled it up, and then during the show, it was full, and we had the issue. So that was one of the things we definitely learned. But besides of that, it works super fast. The sites are like 30% faster just because you use Redis as a cache backend. Then varnish. Um, one other thing that we learned was um, usually you configure varnish that whenever you change something, the varnish module in Drupal connects to the varnish and tells him like purge these URLs or do whatever that. The problem is because we have so many requests at the same second to the home page, to the front page. What varnish does is when you purge, let's say the slash to so the front page and then you have 400 requests at the same time that want to visit the front page. Varnish prevents you from not sending all the 400 requests to the back end. It only sends one, and the others basically just are in a loop and are waiting for the answer of that single one that goes to the back end. The problem is if the site is under heavy load, that can take a couple of seconds to rebuild the front page because you had a lot of people voting. So basically, whenever you purge, you, you stop traffic for like four to five seconds. And I said, that's a long time in like, and people like they realize that the site is not reloading or like they come tweets in and saying, ah, the website is broken, whatever. So instead of purging, we started to do refreshing, which is a different system. And we only use that for that specific client. So it basically works like that. That's the Varnish VCL. And what you do is um, you have a normal request that is instead of get or post or whatever, you define a new HTTP code that is refresh. If the client IP is a part, not part of the perch, so that these are our IP addresses, we say like you're not allowed. If they are part of that IP address, you change the request type to get and you tell him and hash always miss, which basically means that request will go through the varnish as it is a miss, will go to the backend, refresh the page, goes back to varnish, and varnish will update its cache. So the cache site will be updated with that request. While at the same time, all the people or all the browsers that do not have this refresh, which are like normal users, they get still the cached site. So with that, you basically just create a cron job that runs every two seconds, or we had it in every three seconds, that refreshes the home page automatically for you. And if one of the requests takes five seconds, it doesn't matter because all normal clients still get the cached version. And after that five seconds, the, the request goes by, varnish again, the cache is updated, and it's there. And with that, we we were just able to um, to handle also in case like the site goes down and whatever. So like no Drupal tells Varnish now please purge, which generates more load on the back end and stuff like that. But I said that is specifically only for these cases um, for these type of websites. Monitoring. So. Um, we monitored a lot of different things in Varnish. So first of all, you want to see all the client requests that come in, and you also want to see all the backend requests. So these are basically the requests that actually go to the backend, and we just monitored them. Um, then we also monitored the most requested URLs in the last 60 seconds, because you can see like some strange stuff. Usually that should be the home page or the slash site, um, but if it's suddenly another page, you realize, okay, maybe something is wrong. 
And then we just over had an overall stats like the hits per second that come in and, and, and these kind of stuff. The servers we just monitored with HTOP. So we just like see them, you see the, the load, you see spikes that happen and whatever. Um, and then we watch Drupal itself. So we use syslog instead of the watchdog entry in the database. Um, and then we just have syslog that we look at the, at the errors that Drupal basically throws. There shouldn't be any error, but if one is, you can already see it. And then we also have New Relic working on the servers. It also gives you like nice stats of like if the site suddenly goes slower or faster or that. And that's how it looked like. So we have it on the left side, we have the actual site that just, just updates. Here we have all the HTOP for the six servers that we just look at, and then we have an iPad with all the varnish stats that like update um, in real time, and that was basically like the monitoring. And we were actually in the studio, so we couldn't do that in the office, so we had like to be a bit mobile with the whole thing. Um, that's what we basically use, and it's a lot of like just looking at data that flows through and like maybe try to see if there is something wrong or not. So what learnings did we have? Um, first of all, there is a really interesting thing. Um, if the Drupal image cache generates you an image, that image is sent without cache headers, even though cache is enabled. So what that means is that if the first request to an image cache picture goes through Varnish, Varnish will get that image without cache headers, and internally Varnish says that's a hit for pass, which basically means that the next 60 seconds that image will be sent to the backend all the time without looking at the cache. That's like an internal warning thing, warnish thing. But um, what it basically means is that for the next 60 seconds, Drupal or the Apache or whatever web server you use will de deliver all the images. So we posted a new picture on the homepage. The picture was never created in the image cache, so the first normal browser generates it, and after that we had for 60 seconds, we had a, a huge amount of traffic on the back end, and after six seconds it's gone. Um, so what we did, we actually had to hack core um, to um, also send generated image with cache headers. It's now fixed in Drupal 8. There is a patch for Drupal 7, I don't know if it will happen um, to get in, um, but that's basically one of the things we had to learn from tech. Then we had a lot of HX stuff, like we had like um, views load more, or we had like HX things that are clear loaded. Everything in Drupal, HX is post requests, and Varnish doesn't like post requests, because Varnish says if post, I don't care, like I don't, but you can, you can cache them. Like, so there is a module that allows you, um, that is used HX get or something, that basically replaces the post with gets. The fun is, the most used Varnish VCL is like one that is done to by a lot of different people that is on Drupal.org. Um, that actually excludes slash Ajax. So if you add the views Ajax get, you have get request, yay, but it's the URL is slash Ajax, so Varnish again will say, oh, Ajax, I'm not caching that. So we actually had to rewrite the Varnish VCL to be able to do that. So if you use the var uh, views get hx and you're worried why the varnish is not caching, that's probably the reason, um, because the configuration is not the best. Another thing that also almost destroyed our site is um, 404 and 403s. Um, usually you don't cache them because if there is a 404, you don't want to cache it because maybe like in in the future that 404 will actually be not a 404 anymore. The problem is we had people that like deleted images on like editors that deleted images and because they were still on the homepage, the picture should be updated and the picture was not available on the backend server anymore. So suddenly Varnish said like, I don't have the picture, I give it to your backend and the backend says like, I have 404, I don't have that. And you generate a huge load on your backend because Drupal tries to grab a picture that doesn't exist and stuff and so, um, and that almost killed one of our sites at one point, or we had like a node unpublished that was sent out over a tweet, and then we have like huge backend requests, and we, what we basically do is we just cache them, not for a long time, but we cache them for like 20 seconds. So during that time, if somebody requests something that doesn't exist, Varnish will reply with a cached 404 um, 
which prevents you your backend servers from dying. Um, so that was, I guess, like on the second show, like suddenly all my servers were burning. And then you ask the editors, and they tell you, "Yeah, I just deleted the picture. Is that bad?" So maybe don't delete anything during the show. Learnings from processes. So um, one really big learning, be there. So we were in the studio at the same time where the whole thing was, was shown or like was captured. Um, because there's no better thing to actually be there with the people that use it. We tried to do it remote because we had to travel like an hour or two to get there and it doesn't really work. It's the, in situations like that where the site has to run for two hours and it really has to run, trying to do Google Hangouts, nah, it doesn't work. Like you have to sit in front of the screen and actually look there. You have to be flexible a lot. We had the main rehearsals on Saturday at three o'clock and the show started at eight o'clock in the evening. The show took two hours, so till five. So if we realized we have to change something, we actually had three hours to implement something, test it, deploy it to be ready till like 7.30 where like everything had to be ready for eight o'clock. And sometimes we realized during main rehearsal that, that we completely forgot something. Like we forgot what's shown during the commercial breaks. Happened in the first show. So we had like backend developers and frontend developers sitting there and like hacking something in which is like against any other like project method and whatever, but what do you want to do? It's, you only know three hours before you go live what your requirements are. So you have to do it. Be proactive. Um, we did, as I said, we did a lot of monitoring. So like proactively looking at things, looking at stats, trying to learn from the stats if there is something going different than last time. It's a lot about these things. So like all the issues that I told you before, we basically realized that while the code, like while the requests are changing behavior, um, because if, you, if you're not proactive, your servers will be dead, and most probably first you're screwed, and second you don't really have the data anymore, so it's, it's better to like be proactive there. And then also prepare as much as possible. So as I said, the first six to 10 shows, they were pre-captured. So we knew exactly what happened in the show. So we created all the polls. We created all the, all the stuff that should be shown, all the notes, all the images were cropped. Everything was done before that during the show, we could actually only like press a button and say publish, put on homepage, put there and stuff. And without that, it wouldn't really be possible. And at the end, testing, testing, testing. Um, we, as I said, we were there, we had like 10 different test devices at the, at, the, at the place, so we tested it in a lot of different devices. We used browser stack to create screenshots of a lot of different, because if you change the homepage, you don't have a lot of time within three hours to test. So you need like a testing system that gives you like screenshots of all different browsers in all different versions, if the change that you just did to responsive still works or not. So let's look at some results. So what we see here is the, the site. I can show you the site first. By the way, that's not the live site, that's our testing site. So that's now, um, let me disable. So basically you see it, you can really easily off the dashboard, you can just enable or disable the second screen. So I say second screen mode is off. And with that, um, uh, when I go back, that was like the normal site. So we have a huge um, picture on top and then you can scroll down and it's just like, it's like a live stream of some state. So that's how the site looked during the week without, and you see here that we have lo uh, views load more, that just loads more and you can scroll forever down to get new things. Um, it's a pretty standard news site, nothing special. And then you have the second screen mode that you can say, okay, I wanna add the polls. Um, and now it asks you which polls you would like to show. We had two places to show polls. And you see here again, that's the node ID stuff. So we use a lot of the node IDs and the user just can like, now if you try to find something based on that text, you have no chance. So we use the node IDs so the people knew, okay, at the beginning of the show, I have to upload no, or I have to push node ID 888 or so. So we're gonna save that. 
And here you see now how it changes. So we have on the left side, we have a vote. On the right side, we have a poll. And up here is the live stream. So that's the live stream of the television. And if I now gonna change something, and I can show you that here. So on the left side, I'm the admin. On the right side, I'm locked out. And that will now push over there. So I can select now, I don't know, the 912, and I save it. And it will automatically, without doing anything, it will update me on the right side and download the picture. So the users do not have to do anything at all. I just have to change it on the right side. It will update. And it will actually also update on a, on a mobile device. So I have here an emulator of um, iOS, and I just save them, and you see both of them automatically update. And that's basically now pop pushing to PubNub. The devices are registered with PubNub. They get a JavaScript, and they replace whatever needs to happen. So that was like the whole special thing um, there. And then you can vote. So if I gonna vote here, I, I don't know, there's like some questions, and I say, okay, I'm for that, and I see now 33%, and now I'm gonna vote on my iPhone, and you see, you should see what happens with that number here. If I push here, it's automatically updated. So that also, like when I clicked here, it sent to Drupal, Drupal realizes there is a new poll and it pushes automatically the results at the same time. And that was basically the whole um, real-time voting system and stuff. And you can see now here, I'm gonna show you how to hack my site. Um, so in here you have a cookie that basically just says, um, the PA is Paul Annan 893. When I reload now here, you see that I still see the results, so I cannot vote anymore. If I remove that cookie here, it's removed, and I reload again. If the internet wants to work with me. Now I can vote again. So it's that easy. Um, but as I said, that never actually happened. But we had the specification that we that we should deliver something that also um, can do that, we can actually um, vote for real. So that's the SMS voting system. So you can, as an admin, you can just select the SMS voting. You can say like, okay, which SMS voting you would like? They're all prepared. So I say, I don't know, and take that one. And now for that, I have to refresh the page. But that was not, as I said, that didn't happen during the, the site was in live mode. So whenever something now joined, now you see the SMS voting. And I can say, okay, I wanna vote for Swiss Domino or I wanna vote for that, so I wanna vote for them. Opens me an Ajax and now I have to enter my phone number. So I enter my phone number here and hopefully, <laughs> so I should get a text if it, it's gonna make it from Switzerland to here. Yes, you got a text. So I enter that number. I can enter it wrong for a sec. So you can actually see, like it tells me it's wrong. So when I enter the right one, ha. Again. Mm, demo effect. Get a number. I enter that, I finish. Okay, doesn't work. Ha, it worked before. <laughs> <laughs> Last one try. No, doesn't work. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, so basically it would, it would tell me, yes, you voted, and when I go back and add my phone number again, it will tell me you cannot vote, and that was basically the secure voting. But in the end, it's the same Drupal core poll system. So it was exactly the same. Yes, um, that's basically the site. Um, as I said, it was pretty easy from a from a user interface, um, you can like, we had all like HXC way, we did a lot of um, SEO HX stuff and, and such things. But um, I think what would be interesting is that we actually see how the people used it. So I um, have some videos of um, people or how we use the site. So the first one that's, 
as you see, I'm going into the studio. So you see like the people, the talents are here. There's the whole crowd sitting here. You have like a spider cam that captures the whole thing. And so we were actually sitting in the studio and could hear everything, what's happening. And we just like had our special place at the, at the, at the edge a bit. Um, where I go now, through some doors. And you see now the whole team sitting here. So it's like a team of like eight people that work at the same time. And you see like everybody has a screen in front of them. We see all the things. And now um, I'm trying to push a button with my finger. <laughs> but now you see how it updates. So, so you see we had a lot of different devices there that we tried at the same time. And you see now here all the poll HX vote. These are the actual votes that are coming in. So you see them coming in. And that was all captured during the first show. So there's not a lot of traffic, unfortunately, because during the high traffic, I didn't really have time to take videos of the whole thing. Um, because it was rather like, OK, now it's, um, yes. So that was um, one of them. Um, then we see how it actually, so that was an, Another one, um, I unfortunately made it up like in portrait mode, but <laughs> so I think we can. So what you see, that's the, the voice show. So what's happening, they announce who, who wins, like who is the winner of the site. And so we're sitting, we don't know ourselves. So we, at that point, we don't know because they didn't tell us, like even we are one of the backstage team, they didn't tell us who wins because they're worried that we tweet it or whatever. So they announce it now, the moderator announces who wins. People go crazy in the studio. Um, and now we turn around and now we see an editor that actually just saves a poll because at that point she just knew, so she saves a poll and now goes to the admin screen that we saw before, changes to the poll that she just created and I'm going to my screen and she's now pushing that into the site and I can vote, and now you can see the, how the votes are like jumping in. And um, yeah, so that was basically the whole thing that that's what we did all the time. And, and you can see like people like voting and tweeting about, oh no, that's all gonna vote different and whatever. So um, that was a lot of fun. Um, yes, then we have some, um, some voting edits. So. Um, that's actually the back end, so I'm just like on the poll edit and I refresh. So then you can see how the polls are coming in. So we knew how many votes exactly came in. But on the side you just see the percentages. So you don't really see exactly what, um, how many votes that there are. Um, yes, and they are like slowly update. Um, in the second show, we actually only had percentages, which wasn't a lot of fun. The bars were much more fun because you can see like a graphical element. We had the crazy idea to make like these um, buttons bigger and smaller, but yeah, we didn't really have time. So um, yes, then for the um, another one that we did. So here you see that how it updates. So the people actually like I'm voting because I was the first one I had 100%, but now it starts to like slowly get in. Then you see how at the same time the show is actually running. So we also had a TV screen. Um, because the fun is these days, oh let's, let's tell you later. So like now we see like the polls coming in. Um, that's the the, the user traffic, so that's a bit crazier, and you see like the amount of traffic that we had at that point, that's the request per second. And, um, and yeah, so the fun was that these days, because all the TV stuff goes via IPTV and like um, HTTP live streaming and stuff, it's not real, real time anymore. The stuff has a delay of like 20 seconds. So like when you capture something, in the past with analog TV, it was like immediately at the, at the users. But now you have so many delays because of like encoders and stuff, so it's like 20 seconds later. So what actually happened during the first show, we announced who won earlier online than people could see it on the television, which generated some like interesting discussions. Um, <laughs> Because I just said, like, well, I mean, it's cool, no? And they, they didn't like it at all. So, so what we had it was a TV screen that just had 20 seconds delay. 
So we could hear downstairs, because we were in the studio, what's happening, but we used a TV that had like 20 seconds delay to know what probably people see. Because if they push, it takes like a tenth of a second to push it to the devices. So the problem was basically our website was too fast. Well, <laughs> it's not a problem I'm, I'm not happy to have. Um, yes, then some server stats. Um, so these, that's um, the varnish stat. So we see a lot of different, I don't know, can you get a better? So we see a lot of like different requests. So we see like how many cache hits, how many client requests, these are like per second. How many misses, you definitely wanna make sure that the misses are low um, and stuff like that. Then we have these on the left side, the crazy stuff is the requests that actually come in. So that's each single request. That is pretty crazy. Um, of updating, and on the right side, we have the bees, so these are the backend requests. So the left ones are the ones that just go to Varnish and they can deliver. The right ones are the ones that actually go to the backend. And you wanna make sure that these are low, because if they go a bit crazy, your backend servers will probably have an issue. And you see that in there, we only have like some HX stuff that goes through. And the other one is basically just the H top of all the servers, and we see like the load is like at two, zero point three, two, one. So it's all that are eight, like eight cores um, servers, so they don't have any load. But um, we were just preparing for the worst, whatever can have happen. So it's basically us just sitting in front of screens and looking at stats and see. And that's actually pretty cool. You see the varnish here, and the varnish has a load of zero point three two. Um, even though he handles like four types of requests at the, at the second right now. So without that thing, we couldn't survive. Um, yes. Um, yeah. So basically, that's, these are the results. Um, we did it three times now, um, and we're gonna continue doing it um, because they really like that second screen environment, and actually some people actually called it the first screen now, so the, our website is the first screen because they're gonna look more on the device than actually on the TV screen, um, which is interesting how it shifts. Um, so we're gonna continue doing it. We're also thinking of actually using it at real events because you're not like only um, fixed to the environment of sitting in front of a TV. Um, you could also do it at an event, like where people are, like at a DrupalCon or whatever. You could do the voting during Dries notes and whatever. So there's a lot of different ways of using that system. And we're like actively talking to a lot of different people of like, okay, how could we use that um, in other environments? Yes, that's it. If you have any questions, we have like 15 minutes. Can you go to the microphone because of the recording? Thank you. <laughs> Did uh, people in the actual live audience during the live taping have access to the site to vote as well? You mean that the audience? The audience of the show. Um, yes, the problem was that the Wi-Fi that was there wasn't really handling the whole thing. <laughs> so, um, and the actual cellular network also was a bit overwhelmed with the amount of people. Um, so they had, but I didn't really know if people were using it or not. When, then what happened uh, when the show ended? Did the site push to a new state or did the user have to refresh? Um, the site just kept, we kept the site running for like, or the live stuff for yeah. another 10 minutes. Um, just to like do some end votes, how did you like it, whatever. And, um, and then to go actually to the state back, we first thought that we actually have to push, but we did, we did, we, we did analysis of sessions and people anyway like go away like with the devices. So no, if somebody would have stayed the whole week and never refreshed the page, they would have seen the last second of the, of the, of the second screen all the time, but there was nobody that actually did that. Um, did you have to deal with the show airing at different times in different areas of the country at all? No, we s luckily only have one time zone. That's something that we deal with in second screen experiences okay. here in the US where we have different airings where something might be live on the East Coast at this time and oh tape wow. delayed on the West Coast. And so deal, that's something that you may consider as you build out this platform, whether you are planning on supporting other yes. countries too. Good so. point, yes. We actually had an issue that um, 
the whole thing is geo-blocked, so you cannot watch the, the live stream from other countries in Switzerland because of licensing issues. So, yeah, we were lucky, but definitely, yes, it could be an interesting thing that if you need, need to know in which time zone you are first. Uh, and then finally, uh, where did you host it? Was it self-hosted or was it hosted with uh, broadcast? Um, we hosted everything ourselves because in that stage, I need so much control over the servers and all the things that I just have a hoster that makes sure that the hardware works and we're gonna do the whole environment setup and stuff. And we, we have DevOps people ourselves so we can do that. Um, and also there is none of the uh, Drupal hosters that exist have any servers in Switzerland. And the client told us we have two hosts in Switzerland so that was like the requirement that nobody could meet anyway. Well congratulations, it was great. Thank you. So a, a technical question. You were talking about the image caching not being cached um, because of the lack of headers. Yes. Um, so did you look at adding those headers in the VCL rather than doing it from code? And is there a specific reason why you didn't do that? Sorry, I can understand. Add the headers in the VCL? Yeah. So have VCL detect that it was an image cache and then just add a header at that point rather than... Of course. Yeah. It would also be a possibility. I trust the more so that it's, it's a broken Drupal, so I'm going to fix it in the Drupal. Yeah. <laughs> but um, of course, I can in the VCL you can do whatever you want, and um, yeah. Okay, sure. Thanks. So why did you use Redis instead of Memcache? So there is one big problem with Memcache is um, in Drupal caches you have wild cache flush, a wild card flushes. So let's say if you run a Drush CCL, it clears all cache page flushes. And the request to the cache backend goes in cache on the line page colon asterisk. So it basically says clear all cache entries that start with cache on the line page. Memcache cannot do a search in the current existing um, cache. So you cannot, like in SQL, delete from where key starts with that and that. You cannot do that. Memcache is not able to do that. So what Drupal does, it creates a semaphore with a timestamp when it was deleted the last time. And when you, when you request a cache page, like that was deleted or purged, it's still loaded from memcache because memcache had no way to remove it. And then after it's loaded, it also loads the semaphore, compares timestamp, realizes that the semaphore is earlier than the cache creation, and basically delivers you with an empty result because it was an old one and also deletes it in memcache. So it has to work around the issue that Drupal needs a cache that has wildcard or searchability in the cache keys, but does not have. And Redis has that. So if you tell Redis, delete me everything that starts with cache on the line page, it goes through its index and it removes it really. So you don't need to create any semaphores. And in these environments, where it's like it's really important and you just run a rush CC all maybe 10 minutes before the show to like reschedule everything, we just saw a lot of traffic of memcache and we completely switched everything to Redis. It's, it's maybe on like one or two percentage faster. But if you do stuff like that, you will definitely see that. Like you, you can see it in, in um, New Relic, you saw, you saw the switch between memcache and Redis. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm just curious about PubNub and how it, it handles it on its side for the client side. Is that like a polling option that you just add some JavaScript that pulls PubNub or? If you look at it, they do a lot of different things. So if you don't have a lot of updates, they do a long pull, a long pull, I, I guess it's called. So you just have like a request that is like never ending and when there's actually something, it ends and it reloads. But they also use WebSockets at some point, like de depending on the device, depending on the environment, how many pushes you have, how many streams you have um, registered to, uh, they do their own thing. So you don't know exactly what they do, but they do it really well. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Hi. Um, by the way, thanks for a uh, great talk. Um, I've, I mean, think about it. It seems like the voting aspect is the one that is, the like, story, which aspect? The the voting. The part, voting. Yes. The poll would account for a lot of the traffic. Um, yes. Is it? So I would assume that you're not caching the request in Varnish, or oh, the request in Varnish, or how how exactly? How exactly do you manage the load for? So the actual voting that has to go to Drupal, like the post request of clicking on a button 
that goes to Drupal and that has to bootstrap with Drupal and everything. So you cannot do that just with Varnish because it has to enter an in a data into the MySQL. And um, the request that is sent, um, so after voting, it also um, reloads the newest results. And that result is automatically used to push to all the devices again to update. So yes, you have one post and that's why we have six servers. Because um, during TV breaks, actually the most traffic happens because people, they don't like to see TV bre uh, commercial breaks, so they're just gonna look at the phone and gonna vote. And during that time, we had a lot of traffic and that's what we actually had six servers for because there's no way to handle that. Yeah, so. So is it one of the aspects where you guys use Redis to? Yes, okay. correct. All right, just, all right, correct, okay. yeah. How did you guys get this client? Did they already know you? Did they want Drupal or did you have to respond to some RFP? So this, this is like the, the 14th website we've built for them. So it's like a longer relationship. Um, interesting is they have their own internal CMS team, um, but they are so used with the CMS building their own website um, that we, um, they asked us if we can do something. And because we are so small, and can actually like do stuff really fast. Um, that's why they, they, they chose us. And what it, they didn't came with that from the beginning. These are the requirements. That's stuff that like has happened over actually years of like working to GAM and then also trusting. Like before we never did any SMS voting because they said like, oh, it's the, like we don't trust. And so now it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of trust building and trying out and suggesting a lot of things and so. So it's definitely something you cannot just do in one day of like discussing with them or so. Thank you. Um, why did you use PubNub instead of something like Socket.io? Instead of? Socket.io. Um, it was just easier. Yep. Um, so we, we tried to first use Socket.io but um, we somehow found about PubNub and, and and we tried it out, and especially like in the edge cases where you, like let's say you're in a train and you don't have a lot of connection, then you have connection again. The PubNub script somehow realizes that and goes to the server again and says like, did I maybe miss one? And it updates, it's also like on the phone, if you close it and you open it again, it will reload and connect to the server again. So there's a lot of things that happen outside of that, that Socket.io is like built for like, okay, I have a stable connection there. And that's just what we liked at the end. Um, so, but from a technical point of view, there is no need to do that. Cool. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm working on a very similar project for Telemundo.com. Mm -hmm. A lot of crossover with what you're talking about. And I was interested to know a little bit more about the um, editorial testing that you did with, with the editors, because that's one of our huge pain points. Um, yes, it's basically we just let them work on it and looking at their behavior, how they worked. So because we had the, the first sessions, they were all pre-captured. We did like rehearsals. So we just sit in a, in a room, let the show run, and they, they were all doing it as it, is, as it is a real thing. And we just had me and other people from, from the team being with the team and looking like, okay, what are you doing? And then you realize like, Every time, I don't know, they replace, an, like one of the things they need uh, like, um, was they, they created all the polls without pictures because they didn't have the pictures yet because the photographers didn't provide the pictures yet. So they, up, they created the polls with dummy pictures because the picture was, was a mandatory field. So we realized, okay, we removed the ma mandatoriness. But then they had the problem that they pushed a poll on the live show without a picture. So then we did like we did a small view that showed them which polls have no picture yet. So it's basically just with being with them at the shows and working with them together, you realize a lot of things as a Drupal site builder that can make it much easier for them. But there was no real like, um, I don't know, like a process of doing that. We just worked with them together and most of the things we, we learned ourselves. Okay, thank you. I guess this is a good follow-up question for that. Is uh, you know, how did you guys manage the tape shows? Was everything done live still, or did you kind of schedule things out and watch it go with hands off? What what do you, which shows? The the ones that were taped in advance. Yes. So were like were the content editors live pushing content during the broadcast then? 
Yes, yes. So we were just sitting in a room and, and we watched a TV show and while that we were like pushing buttons based on the TV that came in. So we could have basically everything orchestrated before, like you could do a little crazy scheduling stuff and you just could sit there and do things. But um, it's it's still like we we, we decided, even the whole thing was pre-captured, sometimes you sit there and say like, oh, now it feels like kind of like slow, let's create another poll and somebody created a poll and put it on. Okay, did you find so that people did that a lot? To, yes. Okay, yeah. and so did you take any data from social also to, to filter in with that? Um, yes, so okay. we had um, people monitoring Twitter, we had people mo monitoring Facebook, we had, sometimes we had a discuss chat on the page itself, there were people at chatting, and based on that, on like the, yeah, there's a lot of things that like influence you. What do we do now? Polls based on. So I would say like 95% of all the polls were pre-created, and 5% we did on ad hoc on the fly. Yeah, thank you. How were you able to calculate the number of web servers you had? Like you had six as opposed to like let's say ten. Um, so the whole cluster we use is not only specific for that client. Um, so we host other stuff as well on the cluster, and we just basically looked at the load. So um, we went, six was too much at the end. So we just said, the problem is if you ask these clients, like how, how many people do you expect right. they tell you, I don't know. And yeah. n I don't know, can be 20 or 20,000. Like it's, so we shot way too big, and then we looked at the, at the load during the first show, and then we started to remove servers. The problem is that with the shows, the people realize that the website exists because they're like, go now to the website and vote and things. So people, the traffic goes up through the show. So we actually ended up in having six servers at the beginning, thought, okay, it's too much. Thought about downscaling, said, no, okay, now let's wait just two, three more days and more shows. And then we saw, okay, actually it's, it's okay. Um, so it's just a guessing. <laughs> It's, it's a lot of that. Thank you. Okay, I think we're anyway over time. Um, thanks a lot. If you have more questions, I'm around. Um, yeah, hit me. Thank you. <laughs>